Amen. Good evening. And welcome to Living Word live stream. Amen. Let's see. All right. All right. We'll start with prayer this evening. Hallelujah. Heavenly Father, we thank you again, Lord, for preserving and keeping us under your wings, Lord. We thank you for providing our needs, and we thank you for opening our eyes that we may behold wondrous things in your word tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, tonight, uh, I'm going to continue on with the grace that has appeared to all men, number two. And I'll start with a little review because there were some of my notes that went missing last time. So I'm going to fill in the gap, try to move quickly through this. Uh, our text comes from Titus 2, 11, starting at verse 11. And it says, for the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify to himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. Uh, taking a brief look back, uh, at verse 11, so we talked about uh, how some ways God's grace appears uh, to, to men. And we talked about, uh, the first one was God's grace appearing through general revelation in his creation of the universe. Psalms 8.1, if you would turn there. Psalms 8, 1 says, and I'm going to read this from the Holman version, it says, Yahweh, our Lord, how magnificent is your name throughout the earth. You have covered the heavens with your majesty. And then in Psalms 19, 1, it says, the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament shows his handiwork. And then in Colossians 1.17. In Colossians 1.17 it says, And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. And by consist, <clears throat> it means to stand together, to be fixed firm, to be fixed and permanent in a permanent state, to be supported and maintained by God. And in Psalms, 60, Psalms 33, verse 6, starting in verse 6, All right, in Psalms 33, starting in verse 6, it says, <clears throat> By the word of the Lord were the heavens made, and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. Going on to verse 7, He gathers the waters of the sea together as a heap, and he lays up the depth in, his, in storehouses. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. For he spake, and it was done, he commanded, and it stood fast. And how great is our Lord that he can maintain the whole universe and yet still have a personal relationship with each one of us 
and deal with us where we are in life. It's, it's amazing. And uh, in Psalms 147, verse 4, it says of God, he tells the number of stars, he calls them all by name. That says not only does he know the number of stars, but he calls each one by name. Amen. Uh, now, when I, here's where uh, I think I lost some of my notes last time, so I'm going to try to move quickly through this. Uh, in creation, uh, the point I was trying to make is how God created, what God created was perfect. Uh, but the bad things that we see are of the devil. And I'm going to shoot through this quickly so y'all could just write it down. Uh, in Genesis 1.31, it says, And God saw everything that he made, and behold, it was good. It was very good, is what it says. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. So if God said it was very good to us, I believe that would mean perfect. In Genesis 2.7, it says, and God formed man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. So man became a living soul. And in verse 8 he said, And God planted a garden eastward of Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And then he caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, took, his, took out a rib, and there he made uh, a woman and brought her to man. Now, when God planted this garden, do you think there were any thorns or thistles in it? Well, what happened? In Genesis 3, 1, it says, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field, which the Lord God made. And he said to the woman, Yes, has God said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but the fruit of the tree in the middle of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. And the serpent said to the woman, you shall not surely die. So there we have the, the beginning of the fall of creation, where he lied to, and deceived Eve. And in Genesis 3, 6, it says, and when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant, to the eyes and a tree to be desired to make one wise she took the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also to her husband and he did eat now before this God had given them only one command one command think about that and that was in Genesis 2 16 the Lord commanded the man saying of every tree of the garden you may freely eat but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat of it in the day that you eat thereof, you will surely die. Now, because of the lie and deception of the devil, it caused the fall of man and the corruption to come into what God had created. And Jesus said about the devil himself, says uh, in John 8, 44, All right, Jesus said of the devil, let's see, John 8, 44. I believe this was to the Jews that said they were of the seed of Abraham, yet they sought to kill him. And Jesus said to them, say, you are of your father, the devil, and the lusts of your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and stayed not and stayed not in the truth, because there was no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. And then he goes on in John 10:10 10, 10 to say, The thief comes not but to steal, to kill, and to destroy. And I am come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. Now, because the devil lied and deceived Eve, and Adam willfully ate of the forbidden fruit. Uh, it brought a curse on, came on all creation. 
And in Genesis 3.22, and the God and the Lord said, Behold, the man has become as one of us to know good and evil. And now at least he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. And to Adam he said, this is verse 17. To Adam he said, Be, because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree of, of which I commanded you, saying, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for your sake, in sorrow shall you eat all the days of your life. And then he goes on in verse, 13, verse 18 and says, Thorns also and thistles shall be brought forth to you, and you shall eat the herb of the field. And going on in verse 19, In the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you shall return. So we see there um, judgment pronounced against Adam. Let's see. And it goes on in three, Genesis 3, 20, verse 24, he says, So he drove, the man, drove the, out the man, and he placed at the east of the Garden of Eden a cherubim and a flaming sword that turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. So they were sent from paradise to live and work by the sweat of his brow. Once again, when I read this, it took me back to the farm that I mentioned last time that we used to live on. And uh, you may say, Brother, why do you keep going back to that farm? Well, it was, a, it, was a, it was a peaceful time in our lives. We didn't have much, but living on that farm, we, you know, we roamed, we ran up and down in the woods. We, you know, it, was, it was just a time that I re remember because I know when we moved on from there, we moved to a different place. I became older and then things began to change, but that was a time of peace, even though we didn't have much. Um, but I remember we used to climb over the fence into the, um, where the cows were, into the cow lot, we called it. And there they had the biggest blackberries you ever want to see because they had natural fertilizer, you see. And uh, we picked them. And, of course, always the biggest and juiciest ones were down in the bush. So you had to reach in for them. So... How great would it have been not to have those thorns in that black blackberry bush when we were reaching in for them? We, you know, we constantly had scratches on us, but we didn't care as long as we got those berries. But uh, I'm just saying that to, as an example, you know, of what I think is part of the curse, you know, those thorns that those blackberries had. And then also, I like to plant a uh, vegetable garden because there's nothing like fresh vegetables from the garden your own garden. But what happens when you neglect it? Weeds. So in my opinion, weeds are part of the curse also. Um, but even though there's corruption uh, in the world and in creation, we still see the majesty in what God created. Um, in John 1.17, it says, For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Uh, my point being that Jesus brought truth, but the devil brought a lie and corruption with him. Now, before Jesus came into our lives, or my life, you know, was full of, our lives were full of lies, deception, wrong motives, um, uh, in a lot of what we, what we did. But Jesus brought truth and honesty to our lives. This is what Paul wrote about creation in Romans 1.18. All right, let's see. All right. And in Romans 1.18, it says, uh, oh, this is one I want to read in the, the Holman's translation that I have here. 
It says, for, for God's wrath is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of people who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. Since what can be known about God is evident among them because God has shown it to them. For, in, for his invisible attributes, that is, his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly seen since the creation of the world, being understood through what he has made. As a result, people are without excuse. And this is what Timothy says about the scripture, in case you don't believe what that said. It says, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. That the man of God may be perfect and thoroughly furnished in all good works. So in conclusion to this part, the very order and magnificence of creation around us should make us think there's someone behind what that caused this to happen. It didn't just happen by itself. But some would say, brother, what, what about the Big Bang Theory? My answer to that would be, God spoke it and bang, it came into resist existence. So. <laughs> Uh, uh, moving on, Titus 2.11 again says, For the grace that brings salvation has appeared to all men. The second uh, point that I made about it was uh, the preaching of the gospel. That's another way that, the, that God's grace is presented to all men. Uh, in Matthew 9... 35, if you'll turn there. Okay, in Matthew 9, <clears throat> 35 and following, it says, talks about Jesus, and it says, And Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom. Heal, and healing all manner of disease and all manner of sickness. But when he saw the multitude, he was moved with compassion for them because they were distressed and scattered as sheep not having a shepherd. Then saith he unto his disciples, the harvest indeed is plenty, plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore that the Lord of harvest, that he send laborers into the harvest. Are we willing to be laborers to be used of the Lord in the last days? To have compassion on people and share the grace of the gospel of Jesus with them? As I was thinking about this, a comparison came to mind of uh, in our society, you know, we've gone through to this point where um, the mindset that every child needs, I mean, y'all might think this is a little off, but every child needs to go to college to get a higher education so they can um, work at these higher paying jobs to make more money and live in comfort and work in the comfort of an office, you know. The jobs that require people to work with their hands were looked down upon. Uh, in other words, laborers, they, you know, people look down upon those jobs. Now there's a shortage in those fields of electrical, plumbing, and et cetera. But some of us were not made for classroom learning. Amen? Uh, personally, I was told by several people years, of years ago in the industry that I was in, that I had the equivalent of a bachelor's or master's degree in chemistry, uh, but I never went to college. Uh, it was a good work ethic uh, because I grew up poor. I wanted better for my family. Uh, 
And I think for that reason, that's why most people want to see their children have a better education so they can uh, have a better life by getting a better education. So in uh, 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 11, Uh, it says here, say, and that you studied to be quiet and do your own business and work with your own hands as we commanded you, that you may walk honestly toward them, them that are without and that you may have lack of nothing. You see, back then I was applying uh, God's principle of work. Uh, without knowing it at the time uh, because my salvation hadn't manifested yet. But it shows how God's principles that he set forth work. Uh, when I was hired at that particular job, I started in the lowest position that you could have, and it was messy and hot um, and cold in the winter. Uh, I was loading batches of uh, bags of resins and pigment. It was dusty, smelly. Uh, but once I learned something about the business, instead of uh, going into the locker room, a lot of guys, we had to take our samples to the laboratory and have them tested. Uh, so a lot of guys would just go sit, take a break, you know, smoke, whatever. Um, but once I learned a little bit about the business, I began doing things on my own just because it made the day go faster and, you know, that was just the way I was made up. Um, so I'd sweep the floor, tape up broken bags, put inventory away, um, whatever I saw that needed to be done. And one day the vice president, as I was out cleaning up, came by to talk to me and he said, uh, the president of the company and I have noticed the way you work, and uh, we wanted to know if you'd be interested in moving into the laboratory or higher position when it becomes available. So I was like, sure, you know. Um, not knowing all of what God had in store for me, but, um, and my career went on from there in this particular industry. I went to head of quality control, uh, then I went into research and development, technical sales, and then they wanted me back in quality over all of it because the person they put in charge, he was letting things slide. So, um, let's see. So eventually I was in charge of the whole operation toward the end. Um, but I'll go into more, more detail on it at another time. Along the way, I got saved, and God gave me favor with people, uh, which, um, they which I started getting requests to come to their facility, and uh, when they had issues and, and projects that needed attention. So they would ask for me personally to come to their facility. So I traveled, ended up traveling a lot in you know, what was technical sales at that point to help them troubleshoot what was wrong. Now, in the flesh, if we're not careful, we can have a tendency to let success and comfort go to our heads. Uh, so when you become successful, don't, don't let business, pleasures, pride, complacency push God back from being your first love. Uh, how many of you know that God doesn't like that? Amen. He doesn't like second place. Um, <clears throat> uh, and turn to Joshua twenty three fifteen. Hopefully this will make sense when I get to the end. Uh, in Joshua 23, 
15, it says, Therefore it came to pass that all good things are come on you, which the Lord God had promised you. So shall the Lord bring on you all evil things until he have destroyed you from off this good land, which the Lord your God has given you. <clears throat> when you have transgressed the covenant of the Lord your God, which he commanded you, and have gone and served other gods and bowed yourself to them, then shall the anger of the Lord be kindled against you, and you shall perish quickly from the good land which he has given you. Uh, so can the scriptures give us warnings about how we should live and conduct our lives? Amen, I think so. Because it says here, for whatsoever things, and, and this is Romans 15, 4, I'm going to quote, for what, whatever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures may have hope. Uh, in Mark 9, I mean, Mark 12, 29. <clears throat> uh, speaking of, uh, of the Lord being our... Uh, it says, and Jesus answered, the first of all commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one God, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind mine with all your strength. This is the first commandment. Uh, now how many of you know that God has a ways and means committee? He has ways and means to deal with each of us on a personal and individual way. Uh, there's an example of this I believe in Genesis 32. See. Yeah. I think here this was called the Song of Moses, Genesis 32, and uh, verse 15. It says, But Jeshurun waxed fat. Now, Jeshurun, from what I looked up, is another name for Israel. It says it's the, uh, the poetic name of Israel, but it refers to, to Israel. I think it was used three times in Deuteronomy and one time in Isaiah, I believe. But he's speaking to Israel here. He said, but Jeshurun waxed fat and kicked. Thou art waxen fat, thou art grown thick, thou art covered with fatness. Then he forsook God, which had made him and lightly esteemed the rock of his salvation. They provoked him to jealousy with strange gods, with admonitions prov provoked they him to anger. They sacrificed unto gods, unto devils, not to God, to gods whom they knew not, to new gods that came up newly, that came newly up, whom your fathers feared not. Of the rock that begot thee, thou art unmindful and has forgotten God that God formed thee. I think this was prophesied of Israel. I think this was toward the end of uh, Moses' reign and when he was, turning, he was uh, turning the leadership over to Joshua. Because I also see over in um, Genesis 31, verse 14, it says, And the Lord said unto Moses, Behold, thy days are, are, thy days approach, that thou must die. Call Joshua and present yourselves in the tabernacle of the congregation that I may give him a charge. And Moses and Joshua went and presented themselves in the tabernacle of the congregation. And it says there that, and the Lord appeared in the tabernacle, tab, tabernacle in a pillar of cloud. And the pillar of the cloud stood over the door of the tabernacle. And this was uh, yes, and it says, um, 
the Lord gave this prophecy to Moses, I think, right after that, saying, The Lord said unto Moses, Behold, thou, thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, and this people will rise up and go a whoring after the gods of the strangers of the land, whether they go to be among them, and will forsake me and break my covenant, which I have made with them. And then in verse 19, he's instructed Moses to write these, write this, write this in a song. So, but it shows how we can be living a good life, get into the promised land. But if you forget God, you bring judgment upon your life. And we see examples of that throughout the Old Testament. In the last days, has the church in general come to a place of comfort and complacency with its organized religion, where we come together, perform a religious program that allows us to go home feeling uh, good about ourselves? We can't wait you know, to get home to find out who's winning the game, what the score is. And I don't, is, I'm as guilty as anybody. So I don't say this to condemn anybody. How many times have we missed an opportunity to go into our closet and pray for a situation or someone, our neighbor, someone in need, because we wanted to fulfill our own fleshly desires? There was a movie um, years, I don't forget how many years ago it came out, but not too awful long. It was called The, the War Room. I, I don't know if any of y'all have seen that, but in my opinion, it was, a, it was a good movie. It was well done, but it really showed the power of prayer and how one somebody could change things by being a prayer warrior. Uh, and in Second Chronicles 7, 14, which is a familiar passage of scripture, it says, I think we've quoted it a lot, if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven. I will forgive their sins and I will heal their land. Our country is in great need of prayer at this time. With all we see that's going on. We read earlier in Joshua twenty three sixteen. how quickly God can cause things to change. And we've seen that in the past few months in our country. I mean, we went from creating jobs, almost, I think, full employment, stock market up, to millions of jobs being lost, businesses being shut down, the stock market, stock market dropping. So I think God is showing us just how quickly things can disappear and be taken away from us, especially if we're not mindful of him and keep him first in our lives. And if nothing else in speaking on prayer, um, we can pray what God spoke in Matthew 9, 38. It says, pray ye therefore the Lord of harvest that he would send laborers into his harvest. So after all, we're called to follow Jesus as our example. And how often did he go away to pray? All right, the third way that we said God's grace appears to people is through our testimony and our lifestyle. Uh, turn with me to Matthew five, thirteen. All right, it says in Matthew 5, 13, so you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt has lost its savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is henceforth good for nothing, but to be cast out and to be trodden underfoot of men. You are the light of the world, a city that is set on a hill, cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it gives light to all that are in the house. 
Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. And uh, speaking of being a testimony, I found this quote uh, by D.L. Moody that I thought fit this perfectly. He said, out of 100 men, one will read the Bible. The other 99 will read the Christian. So, uh, people I worked with over the years, a lot of them, as after I got saved, they didn't understand my life or uh, why I had changed, because a lot of these people I ran with that I worked with, and they saw the change come over me. You know, they saw me stop doing the things that, that I used to do. Uh, but even though they didn't understand me and probably talked about me behind my back, which <laughs> didn't bother me, uh, some of them, though, would come and talk about situations in their life and want me to pray for them. And um, I was not, I mean, I was not perfect by any means, but I think at certain times, if you're living right, people will see that glimmer of Christ coming forth out of your life. Um, uh, Colossians 4, 6. I'll just quote that if you want. Um, it says, let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer every man. And here's what Paul says about preaching the word in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. He says, let's see, and I brothers, when I come to you, came to you, came not of excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness, in fear, and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching was not with, in, with enticing words of men's wisdom, but in the demonstration of the spirit and of the power. That your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. All right, so we talked about three ways that God's grace can appear. But God is not limited on how he can cause his, his grace and to appear to anyone. If we look in Acts 9... In Acts 9, starting in verse 1, uh, the account of Paul's <clears throat> uh, conversion. It says, meanwhile, Saul was still breathing threats and murders against the disciples of the Lord. He went to the high priest and request, requested letters from him to the synagogues in Damascus so that if he found any men or women who belonged in the way, he might bring them as prisoners to Jerusalem. As he traveled and was nearing Damascus, a light from heaven suddenly flashed around him. Falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Who are you, Lord, he says, I am Jesus, the one you are persecuting, he replied. But get thee up, go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless, hearing the voice, but seeing no one. And said, then Saul got up from the ground, and though his eyes were open, he could see nothing. 
So they, they took him by the hand and led him to Damascus. So this was God's grace coming to Paul in a more direct way. By that I mean Jesus himself from being, not from being convicted by the gospel being preached to him necessarily, although he was under apparent conviction from uh, the account of after seeing Stephen being stoned to death and hearing him say back in Acts 7 verse 59, the account where it says and they stoned Stephen calling calling God and saying Lord Jesus receive my spirit and he kneeled down and cried out cried with a loud voice Lord lay not this to their charge and when he had said this he fell asleep and Saul was consenting to his death and at that time there was a great persecution against the church which was at Jerusalem and they were, all, they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. And it, said, it goes on to say, and, for, and as, as far as Saul, who made havoc of the church, entering into every house and hauling men and women, committed them to prison. So we see Paul was a great persecutor of Christians at this time. Now, we're all unworthy of God's grace, but he revealed it to us anyway. How much more unworthy uh, was Paul in that he was murdering Christians and putting them in prison? But the same grace was given to him. God could have taken him off the scene anytime he pleased. But God had a purpose for his life to promote the gospel of Jesus Christ. How about us before God's grace appeared to us? What were we involved in? When I think back on the car wrecks and drinking and much else and some other things that I won't mention, God, I see now that God was watching over me during that time, and I didn't even know it. I'm sure some of you could say the same thing. But you, let me see. But you and I, I think um, God has a purpose for us as well. He wants us ready. When he calls upon us, as he did Ananias, when he called upon him to go lay hands on Paul, he had a few questions knowing Paul's reputation for persecuting Christians. But nevertheless, he, he obeyed and went. God's amazing grace. Um... <clears throat> Quoting again from uh, the concordance, Matthew Henry concordance, what he said about grace was divine grace comes down like dew and waters the church without noise. So in nature, or in the natural realm, we, 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 we never hear the dew falling. But when we get up early in the morning, we see the evidence of it. It's all over the grass and the trees, bringing a ref refreshment to the, to the plants. Uh, let's look at Lamentations Starting in verse 21 says, this I recall to mind, therefore have I hope. It is of God's mercies that we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is his faithfulness. So each morning we get up, thank God for waking, waking you up and giving you the breath of life. Remember to look out at the dew. 
And remember that God's mercy and grace are new every morning. And the rest of the verse says, great is his faithfulness. The Bible has so much to say about subjects when you, when you get to studying them that sometimes you don't know where to stop and go to your next point at because it's so much there. Um, but we're going to move on to verse 12 in Titus 2. All right, and <clears throat> it says, after it... Um, Speaking of God, say, after it has appeared to all men, it teaches or instructs us on how we should live. And what it says is teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. And the NET translation says it trains us to reject godless ways and worldly desires and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. So here it says it trains us, which says to me it's a continual process, teaching and instructing by the Holy, Holy Spirit, how we are to live after receiving salvation. So to me that continual teaching and instruction is that fresh dew that comes down and waters the church without noise it's just God's grace continually being poured out and I think I'm going to stop there for now because I've got a, a lot more to go on the rest of this so so we'll pick up there the next time Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word that you've given us, Father. And we just thank you for causing our lives to be a testimony to this generation, Lord, that we live in. That your grace may appear to all those around us, Lord, that they may be saved and receive Jesus as their Lord and Savior. We thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen.